This lesson is on the skin condition known as vitiligo. In this lesson, we're going to talk about some of the pathophysiology as to why this condition occurs. We're also going to talk about some of the signs and symptoms, how it's diagnosed, and how it's treated. So vitiligo is a primary pigmentary condition involving depigmentation of the skin. So it is a primary condition, which means that it is a condition in and of itself. There's nothing else that is causing the condition. And it involves depigmentation of the skin, which means that it involves removal of pigment from the skin. We're going to talk a bit more about this when we talk about the pathophysiology later on in this lesson. This is an acquired autoimmune condition, meaning that a patient is not born with this condition. They acquire it later in life, and it is an autoimmune condition. We're going to talk again about this a little later on when we talk about the pathophysiology. Now, the etiology, the underlying cause as to why this occurs, is not entirely understood. It is associated with other autoimmune conditions, including Addison's disease, type 1 diabetes, and thyroid disease. And this condition is estimated to affect approximately 1% of the population. And there does seem to be a genetic predisposition to getting this condition. So that means that if there's a family history, particularly a first degree relative, so if you have a parent that has this condition, you're at a higher risk for having this condition than the general population. So genetics does appear to play a role in acquiring this condition. Let's talk about the pathophysiology behind what happens in vitiligo. So if we were to actually look at the skin, we have the epidermis, the dermis, and the subcutaneous layers of the skin. And in the dermis, there are cells known as melanocytes. Melanocytes produce the pigment melanin. And what happens is it produces the pigment melanin, which gets taken up by keratinocytes. So the keratinocytes are the skin cells. So your skin cells take up melanin and give your skin its pigment. And for whatever reason, immune cells become activated and destroy melanocytes. There is autoimmune destruction of melanocytes. So the exact reason as to why this occurs is not entirely known. What eventually happens is there is a continual destruction of these melanocytes leading to progressive loss of melanocytes. And when these melanocytes are destroyed, they cannot produce melanin, they cannot produce that pigment. And then this leads to patches of depigmented skin. Now, where do these patches of depigmented skin often occur on the body? So these depigmented skin patches can often occur in the extensor surfaces. So you can see them on the extensor surfaces of the arms and the legs. The periorificial areas can also be affected. So around the orifices, so around the mouth, around the eyes, around the genital area, these can also be affected as well. And then some other cases can have some more sporadic patches of depigmented skin where we can see it in certain cases. And oftentimes though, they're going to be symmetric. So if you see it on one axilla, you're gonna often see it on the other axilla as well. So again, this is a broad overview of some of the distribution of the depigmented skin and where it may occur. Let's talk about what the depigmented skin looks like more specifically. So the depigmented skin is going to be a macule or a patch. A macule is a skin lesion that is flat and less than 10 millimeters in diameter. So you can see some of these can be less than 10 millimeters in diameter. And a patch is a flat skin lesion that is greater than 10 millimeters in diameter. And you can see here that these are larger than 10 millimeters in diameter. The skin itself is hypopigmented or depigmented, so there is no pigmentation at all, so it looks very light compared to surrounding skin. And the lesions themselves are well demarcated. So you can see here the border as to normal skin and depigmented skin is clearly defined, so it's very well demarcated. The lesions themselves can vary in size. It can be very, very small to very, very large, so millimeters to centimeters in size. And there is no particular shape of the lesion. It can be oval or round or linear shaped. And in some cases, these lesions can be pruritic, which means that they can be itchy. Not always, but in some cases. And some patients will describe a tingling sensation from these lesions as well. Here's another image of vitiligo. And you can see again that the lesions themselves are going to be flat, hypo or depigmented, and well demarcated. And they can have a variety of shapes. Now, there are some other particular clinical features with regards to these skin lesions. One of them is known as Kubner's phenomenon. Kubner phenomenon is when there is an onset of new lesions, so onset of new depigmented skin in areas of cutaneous injury or trauma. So this can occur from anything, from a bump on the arm or a scratch. Any type of injury or trauma may lead to the onset of new depigmented skin lesions in vitiligo. This phenomenon can occur in other skin conditions. In vitiligo, it can affect 20 to 60% of patients with vitiligo.
There can also be some hair pigment changes in patients with vitiligo. So parts of the hair may become depigmented. So there can be some streaks of depigmentation. And then some patients with vitiligo can also have chorioretinitis. So chorioretinitis is an eye condition involving inflammation of the choroid and retina. And this can increase the risk of vision loss. So this can be very important to recognize in patients with this condition. How is this condition diagnosed and treated? So the diagnosis of vitiligo is oftentimes going to be a clinical diagnosis. Looking at the skin lesions that we looked at before can be enough to make the diagnosis, but other cases, Wood's lamp can be utilized to actually visualize the depigmented areas better and more clearly. So you can see here, here's a Wood's lamp showing the depigmented areas around the eye in this patient. And what is noted is a melanosis. A melanosis, A meaning lack, and melan referring to melanin, and osis referring to an abnormal condition. So A melanosis can be noted with a Woods lamp. And if you were to actually take a sample of the depigmented skin and do histopathology on it, you would note that there would be a lack of melanocytes. And because there is an association with other autoimmune conditions, it's also important to assess for other autoimmune conditions like thyroid disease and pernicious anemia. Now, how do clinicians treat this condition? Oftentimes, with regards to the depigmented skin, it's often important to protect against sunlight or avoid sunlight. These parts of the skin that are depigmented are at a very high risk of sunburn, so it's important to avoid sunlight. But in an attempt to actually prevent more depigmentation of skin, narrowband UVB therapy is important. This can actually help prevent or reduce the destruction of melanocytes. Some topical treatments can also be used as well. These include the calcineurin inhibitors, tacrolimus, and pemecrolimus, and then corticosteroids can be used in some patients as well. If you want to learn more about other skin conditions, please check out my dermatology playlist. And if you haven't already, please like and subscribe for more lessons like this one. Thanks so much for watching, and hope to see you next time.